Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. It Oh my gosh, how careless of me. I have left a bunch of RTX 4090s just strewn about here. Half a moment. That's better, but you know what? It's not the first time these pesky $1,600 NVIDIA GPUs have interfered this week, as they also elbowed their way in to steal Intel's spotlight when the review embargo for the ARC A750 and A770 lifted Wednesday. Jensen and company unleashed an RTX 4090 unboxing embargo at the exact same time, forcing reviewers to make the impossible choice, spend several days benchmarking the new Intel GPUs and do a video on that, or maybe 20 minutes shooting an RTX 4090 unboxing video, which will get way more views. Of course, the classy thing for tech reviewers to do would have been to post the RTX 4090 unboxing video the next day, give some space and some air between it and the ARC video, like when you're peeling the bat wings, but not everyone approaches this craft with such refinement and sensibility. Not sure which of those adjectives best describes the gamer's Nexus approach to the 4090 unboxing day, which was to cut one in half with a frickin' water jet. Steve does like to go that extra mile. Other stuff happened this week too, so stick around, it's time for tech news. Excellent. Thermaltake has done it. They've created a case fan with swappable fan blades, and it's called the Swafan. Available in 12 and 14 centimeter sizes, these high static pressure fans are ideal for use with radiators or dust filters, and they come with an extra set of reversed fan blades. Easy to replace and reverse your airflow, so now you can show off your fan's good side no matter where it's installed in your case. They use hydraulic bearings, feature three addressable LED rings, 2000 RPM max speed, and are, of course, very easy to clean. For more on the Swafan from Thermaltake, click the sponsor link in the video description. Let's kick things off this week with a quick look at the big board, where we can see just how far we've come in just a few short weeks. Ryzen 7000 CPUs are launched. Intel Arc GPUs are reviewed at least as of October 5th, if not up for sale yet. And more is on tap with the RTX 4090 launching Wednesday, October 12th, and the Intel Arc A750 and A770 GPUs available at retail stores the same day. The week following, we'll have 13th gen Raptor Lake CPUs to assess on October 20th, and then perhaps a brief respite before the November launches begin, when we anticipate the Radeon 7000 series GPUs will be fighting out with Nvidia's pair of RTX 4080s. But there is an extra significant date to slip in, and that's actually tomorrow, October 10th. AMD's B650 and B650e motherboards for the AM5 platform should be up for sale, providing a slightly more budget-friendly option for PC builders who don't want to spend 300 bucks or more on an X670 board. Check out my video on the differences between these chipsets if you'd like more info, but the big question is about price. AMD promised $125 B650 boards, and while there have been plenty of pictures of the new boards popping up this week, the only real price leak we seem to have is for MSI's lineup, and it's kind of a mixed bag. While yes, it appears that there will now be AM5 boards selling for less than $200, there's only one in this particular stack, the $190 Pro B650 M-A Wi-Fi, which is a micro ATX board. And while yes, the $200 to $300 price range is looking to be more filled out with options compared to what we had with X670, the price creep is plain to see. I keep asking where the obvious bang for the buck option is, which to me is a board in the $150 to $200 range with everything you need and not much else. But let's consider how things have changed since about four years ago in 2018. The go-to recommendation then was MSI's B450 Tomahawk, which could be regularly found for $110 to $120. But perhaps it was too popular of a board as in 2022 it's still available but for $150 and its spiritual successor in the MSI MAG B650 Tomahawk Wi-Fi will be listing for $240, not the go-to bargain price that we had hoped for. I also noticed that this list doesn't include any B650 e boards, which is curious, but perhaps that ideally positioned B650 board exists amongst these other teased images, a trifecta of Oris boards from Gigabyte's lineup, an ITX board as well as a Tai Chi entry from ASRock, and some grainy images of those aforementioned MSI boards, as you can see here, as well as, I suppose, a couple here on videocards.com that are a little bit more clear. We also have a lineup from Asus that includes the usual suspects, Strix boards, here's a little one too. We also have the Tough Series boards in both full ATX and micro ATX trim, 
and a pro art board with some sharp perpendicular lines. We also have NZXT returning with the N7B650E with a similar shrouded design to their previous N7 board, which gives a nice clean finished look. Speaking of a nice clean finished look, the Intel Arc A750 and A770 GPUs were reviewed on Wednesday, and the aesthetics were perhaps the thing that most of the reviewers agreed upon. Intel made some sleek looking GPUs with tasteful RGB lighting, but ultimately the performance is what really matters. Some reviewers like me had a pretty smooth go during testing with minimal driver issues and frame rates that put the A770 in RTX 3060 territory or beyond it at 1440p, although it lagged behind AMD's value-priced RX 6600 XT. Ray tracing performance was also quite impressive and shows where Intel has been investing at least some of their development efforts, although inconsistency from title to title and sometimes poor 1% low frame rates kept the reviews from heaping too many praises on the new ARC cards. There are also compatibility concerns as the cards really need to be paired with newer platforms with resizable bar support to get the most out of them, meaning gamers on older PCs who are looking for a reasonably priced GPU upgrade might need to look elsewhere. I will say this though, the running theme that I picked up on from viewer comments is that people want Intel's ARC GPUs to succeed. There was a lot of optimism for continued driver fixes in the future, and given how cynical the tech world can be at times, especially towards Intel, it was refreshing to hear folks come through with messages of encouragement, because ultimately having more than two players in the discrete gaming GPU market will encourage competition and benefit consumers. The group hug over Intel's ARC launch was quickly interrupted, however, by the distant sound of mocking laughter. Those are cute little $300 to $350 GPUs GPUs you've got there, Intel, NVIDIA seemed to say, but feast your eyes on this. RTX 4090 unboxings aplenty also went live at 6 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesday, somehow striking a balance between reckless hype, useless tech ogling, and I suppose on some level a nostalgic yearning to recapture that youthful exuberance and excitement that we used to approach new PC hardware launches with before we grew up and took to saturating our brains with jaded cynicism and bitter disappointment. Of course, the best RTX 4090 unboxing videos included not one or even two of the new models, but a minimum of three, if not the ideal card count of four. Oh, and that happens to be how many I showed off. What a coincidence. Viewers who were able to suspend their simmering hatred for NVIDIA's pricing and skew positioning schemes were able to gorge their eye holes on a festival bounty of RTX 4090 images and videos, including the Oris Master and Palette Gamerock models as shown off by PC Centric. Der Bauer also had the Oris Master 4090 from Gigabyte, although he spent a good amount of time lambasting them for the marketing copy they used for their Bionic Shark fans. And Jay's two cents had the Asus Strix RTX 4090, which, like most of the third-party designs, is frickin' enormous. Absolutely in awe at the size of these units, with perhaps the only reasonably sized card being MSI's Supreme Liquid X that I showed off. Might as well show it off again here. Which, to be fair, makes use of a 240 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler to push much of the heat over to the radiator. I also showed off the Gigabyte Gaming OC24G, the Asus RTX 4090 Tough Gaming, and the NVIDIA Founders Edition. That video is linked in the description along with these others that I've shown you today if you're interested. And then there's Gamers Nexus, who wouldn't be caught dead publishing an unsubstantive and fluff-laden unboxing video, no. Steve instead decided to essentially kidnap Malcolm Gutenberg, an NVIDIA thermal engineer, and hold him hostage, presumably against his will, while forcing him to watch a precision-engineered RTX 4090 Founders Edition cooler be barbarically vivisected by some advanced jet-powered water torture device. Once the cooler was cleaved in twain, Steve forced poor Malcolm, still visibly shaken by the ordeal, to divulge countless engineering trade secrets and reveal the murky innards of the cooling solution's design, including including the expanded vapor chamber compared to the RTX 3090, and a rather unorthodox look at the hemisected heat pipes. Despite Steve's medieval methods for obtaining this information, I must admit that it was quite enlightening, particularly the details regarding vapor chambers versus heat pipes, and the discussion surrounding the rest of the cooler's details, including thermal interface material and fan design choices that go into manufacturing a solution that can keep a massive, power-hungry GPU like the AD102 chip in the RTX 4090 from getting too hot. Speaking of which, is it getting hot in here, or is it just air friction generating excess heat due to the high-speed delivery of these tech briefs? 
LG Display appears to have heard the call of PC gamers who would like to see OLED panels in smaller sizes, as word is that they're ramping up production of 27-inch and 32-inch screens just in time for CES 2023. The smallest OLED panel LG currently produces is 42 inches, so smaller options for more budget-oriented buyers or those who simply don't have the desk space would be nice. OLED panels can have incredibly fast response times, stunning contrast ratios due to not needing a backlight, and are increasingly available at higher refresh rates like 120 hertz or 240 hertz, such as Corsair's upcoming bendable 45-inch Xenion monitor, which also uses a panel made by LG. Expect demos of the new panels at CES, with the 27-inch version launching in early 2023 and the 32-inch version coming out shortly thereafter. Dbrand made what they're calling a million-dollar mistake with the design of their Project Kill Switch case for the Steam Deck. It turns out that the case's kickstand, which attaches magnetically, can reduce the Steam Deck's fan speed, causing overheating in some situations. But the Steam Deck can ship with two different fans, one manufactured by Huaying and one by Delta, and it's only the Delta models that are affected. But there's no way to tell what fan your Steam Deck uses without taking it apart, so Dbrand is biting the bullet and doing the right thing going public with the issue, suspending Kill Switch sales, providing free replacements to customers who were already shipped to Kill Switch, and developing a replacement mechanical interlock system for the magnetic mount, but that last item might take some time, they say. It's expected to ship in Q1 2023. The world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, Binance, was hacked this week in a cross-chain attack that exploited the link or bridge between multiple crypto blockchains. Attackers exploited a vulnerability that allowed them to mint new BNB tokens, and while they attempted to make off with $568 million worth of crypto that they magically made up out of thin air, Binance mitigated the attack by taking the rare step of suspending transactions and fund transfers after it was discovered, limiting the thieves to stealing between $100 and $110 million, a paltry sum to the likes of you or I. Perhaps this is yet another indication that cryptocurrency is not the magic bullet to solve the world's financial issues that proponents make it out to be? That's probably true, but do you know what's even more dangerous than the wild west of the cryptocurrency? world, a plant with a machete. That's right, a plant with a machete. Here we see the most recent installation from tech artist and sculptor David Bowen that arms a philodendron with cold steel, presumably with plans to scale out and up and grow a squad of seedlings into a battalion of berry bushes so he can take over the world, which is all of our end goals if we're really being honest with ourselves. It's so simple too, just use an open source microcontroller to monitor electrical noises with varying resistance signals from the plant, and then write software to interpret and map them to real-time movements of an industrial robot arm. And then, give it a machete. Soon you'll be able to train up your violent vegetation from a feeble flower formation to a savage swarm of sapient sword-wielding shrubbery soldiers, and our conquest can begin. Yes, I said our. I'm on your team for this one. I already submit to our perennial potentates. And I also submit to you this most recent episode of Tech News for the week. And if you liked it, click that like button or leave me a comment down below. Otherwise, I'll send my plant army to your house next. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested. And check out my store at paulsharbor.net for high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more, including fabulous new 8-bit designs, all printed on shirts of the highest softness and quality available. Subscribing to my channel is always a good call too. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next week.